and good evening, Libertarians. My name is Dan Fishman. I am the Executive Director of the Libertarian Party. And you are in for another night of Libertarians at Large with our at-large members, Eric Raubsepp in North Carolina. Hey! Dr. Laura Ebke in Nebraska. And Valerie Sarwark in New Hampshire. So, guys, thanks, everybody, for being here again. It's a wonderful week. I want to tell everybody that starting next week, after the election... We're going to be on at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So we're moving back one hour. Uh, frankly, I need more sleep. Um, <laughs> but we're going to move it back. And so I know all our regular fans, set your clock, same bat time. No, no, not same bat time. Same bat station, not same bat time. So anybody have a really exciting week for Liberty? Because this is, right, the craziest time for every political junkie. Do you have a crazy story you want to tell? Valerie, I know you got uh, oh, yeah. you have somebody out campaigning in your family right now. <laughs> yeah, actually, he uh, went. To, Nick uh, went to drop off another seventeen hundred um, pre-addressed postcards, or you know the um, the standard ones that you drop off at the post office and they mail out for you, um, because he raised another nine hundred dollars. And on his way, uh, he noticed one of his giant signs was cut down. Like the zip ties were cut. The posts were still up, but the zip ties were cut. And actually Richard Manzo's sign was right next to it. His was also cut down. Some uh, wow. of the Republican signs were new in the area. Um, so he has to go back tomorrow, uh, replace the zip ties and get those back up. So yeah, that was bad news today and it's gonna be snowing tomorrow, so. Sign sabotage <laughs> is one of those things that's incredibly frustrating. And of course, now I don't know what it's like in everybody state but in new hampshire i know that you can put a sign anywhere that's not private property mm -hmm. right? yeah every on the side of the road anything like that and as far as i know they don't actually require you to come pick it up no they, they want don't to, yeah exactly they want you they to take them down when they mow and they take them to the dump and so you go like we've had candidates coming through justin's like right justin lives a block from us yeah. um Justin, Justin yeah, just, sorry, former regional okay. eight, um, rep representative. Um, he's running for Senate. And um, Zach Dumont's running for Congressional District 1. And he's up uh, a little bit north. Um, and then we have a uh, state rep running also for the party. Um, they keep going through the transfer station one by one and then come back and pick up all the signs. So we have like these dump signs to go put back out after they mow. Um, so yeah, we keep recycling the signs and everybody does it, but yeah, you don't have to get up. They, they just take them to the dump. It's interesting. So Maine has a fascinating thing where you can put signs on public property, but every sign has to say, you know, sponsored by such and such campaign and funds. <laughs> well, uh, and if you do, and then <clears throat> afterwards, two weeks after the election, you get fined X amount for every sign that's up with your campaign. Now, of course, that's just begging mm -hmm. for me to collect signs yeah. from my opponent and then put them oh, up yeah. in obscure places where they'll never find them. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little too malicious in my thinking. Mainers are a lot more polite. Uh, I guess they've never had this problem. But it's one of the big issues around doing something like that. Eric, what, signage, what are signage laws like in North Carolina? Actually, uh, oddly similar to Maine. Uh, so if you... Uh, put out signs. You can put out signs anywhere as long as it's public property. Uh, and then uh, after the election, the garbage men go around with the truck and they're supposed to carry, uh, tally up everybody's sign count and uh, you are fined X dollars for every sign that they have to put into the uh, garbage truck. Yeah. Now, to my knowledge, no candidate has actually ever been charged, but that's technically how it's supposed to work. Interesting. And uh, Senator Epke, what's it like in Nebraska for signs? Well, in Nebraska, you can't put them up along the right of way um, on roads and things like that. Um, you can put them up around polling places on election day or within, if you're outside of a circle, um, like 180 feet or something like that. I have to tell you a funny story because in, in 2014, the first year that I ran, um, I went to this little little village, um, about 150 people, the downtown area is not non-existent anymore, and um, was knocking on doors and got a few signs put up. Well, um, about a week later, one of the guys that I'd talked to 
Um, also happened to know my dad and my sister. And he calls me up and he says, can I get one of your big signs? I said, you mean like the big, you know, four by fours? And he said, yeah. He said, I want to put one up on, on one of my garages. Okay. So we took one of the, one of the signs down to him. And then he says, do you have any more of your yard signs? And I'm like, yeah. So I gave him a bunch of yard signs. Um, then um, I hear this story that he's putting up more and my opponent is putting up more. And um, I, I was getting these, these really weird feelings about it. So um, as we're putting up some signs out in, um, out on, on farms one day, um, I say, well, I'm just going to drive through Alexandria, Nebraska, right? Drive through Alexandria just to see what's going on. And it was embarrassing because there's like sign wars. Um, <laughs> My my opponent had signs. I had signs. It was like it was like there was this, this you know Hatfield and McCoys thing going on there between the people and the community to see who could put up the most signs for the person that they were um, that they were for. And, and nobody this you have to understand this village. Nobody goes through it. I mean, it, it, you, you it, it's, it's not as long, like it's on a major highway or anything. It, you have to be going to that community in order to you know in order to see the sign. So it was really. Kind of it's, it's kind of like Christmas lights. You're putting up mostly for your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> so Massachusetts, as you might imagine, you can't put anything on public property at all, uh, including uh, what one of the games that people play is on the overpasses. You try to put a sign up on the overpass so that everybody stuck in traffic will see it as they're driving on the highway and you want to put it up knowing that the state troopers are probably going to come and take it down within 48 hours. But it's not a bad thing to do. Now, if you wanted to stand there and hold the sign, you can do that legitimately. But putting it up there by itself, that's a definite no-no. Maryland, I was shocked to see because there's an early voting place near me. And I, I want to comment on this too. And if you guys have anything about this, please jump in. So I have mentioned before, I live in the middle of nowhere, really in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the nearest polling place to me is uh, it's the volunteer fire department. It is uh, three miles away as the crow flies further as you drive, but it's also roughly in the middle of nowhere. I've driven past it three times. That's where the early voting is. Enormous lines, yeah. enormous lines here in the middle of nowhere to vote. Uh, but the one thing that I did learn is that you can put signs right up to the door of the uh, early voting places. So there's a, wow. a lot of Jorgensen signs there. And okay. I'm a person who likes to do the uh, bend the wire. So you stack three signs on top of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I go back and I check on them. Uh, so if, if there's a high number of Jorgensen, there's probably going to be a high number of Jorgensen voters anyway, just because my wife and I, but <laughs> <laughs> that's probably enough to, to uh, it, because there's so few people here. But if we get an extra high number, I'll know that it had something to do with that. All right, that's my sign chat. Uh, the one other thing I will say is that, uh, you know, we talk a lot about signs, but for people who are out there so, and thinking about running, signs are good, they're great, they don't replace shoe leather. Signs don't mm -hmm. vote. So everybody's got to get out there, knock the door, stuff like that. The sign, I always say the sign is actually a job of how well you're communicating because if people are willing to put up your sign, it means that you've made a convert. And you should use that just like, you know, you, you take temperature of something you're cooking to see what the temperature is. You know, find out how well you're campaigning by how many people are willing to put up your signs. Mm -hmm. But the number of signs that you have up, signs don't vote. They don't make people vote, anything like that. So, uh, okay, we got a couple of uh, interesting things that we always do in the show. But the number one thing that we love to do is the New York Times News Quiz. And, of course, it's been a week. Uh, none of us have looked at this and, uh, the, the news is old. And fortunately, you know, we're in a pretty stagnant news cycle, so it's not like a lot is changing, but I think this quiz is going to be pretty good. The first one is pretty easy. The justice department sued Google on Tuesday. What does it accuse the company of doing a promoting disinformation B using anti-competitive practices, C stealing data, E spying on users. I'm surprised there's not an F all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because, I mean, they definitely have done, uh, at various points in time, they mm -hmm. have certainly been accused of spying on users. Mm -hmm. uh, stealing data, 
huge, uh, mm -hmm. both data and ideas. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess I'm giving away that it's not one of those two. Anti-competitive anti stuff, isn't it? Anti-competitive, I think, yeah, for sure, that's what it is. Yay. Yeah, but accused Google, <coughs> anti-competitive. <clears throat> now, it's very interesting. I, and so I, I'm a tech guy. I was in the uh, internet engineering field for about 24 years. And although Google's position is incredibly dominant, I don't actually think of them as a monopoly. Now, I'm not a lawyer, uh, however, um, there's a lot of competition out there. There is, <laughs> it's a very funny thing, Jared. Um, <laughs> there is, uh, in order for Google to, for me, in my opinion, for there to be a monopoly, there has to be no option. You have to go to them, or at least they have to be dominant. But the thing is, is that there are other options the mm -hmm. problem is just that the other options aren't particularly good, yeah. but that's not Google's fault. Uh, you know, it's if somebody suddenly came out and uh, you know, Tesla, right? Tesla is definitely making the best electric cars and they were for a long time. Could somebody claim, oh, you have the market on electric cars and so you have to be broken up or mm -hmm. should the rest of the market start creating electric cars to compete with? Try them? harder. Exactly. Uh, you, you could make the same argument for cell phones, right? There's only two cell phones. Now, one of the things that Google has been accused of doing in the past, and I would say that I do think this is true, and again, I'm not a lawyer, is that they work with the other, you know, there's, there's six enormous high-tech companies. Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, somebody else. Um, and they definitely have been accused and I believe maybe not pled guilty, but pled no contest to price fixing amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, the salary for engineers is ridiculous. Uh, it is not uncommon for uh, high-end engineers to be making, you know, eight hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars a year, um, which you know is a good salary. There's no question about it, especially for you know sitting in a chair and thinking. Yeah. Uh, but it's very expensive for the high end companies to hire those people at those wages. And I don't want to imply that everybody's making that money, but every, every company, every one of those companies is at least employing, you know, a thousand people around that salary range. Um, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a, my son is a senior in high school. I think we've just discovered what his occupation should be. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you a couple things about it. Having been in the field for a long time. It is absolutely a meritocracy. Um, it is, uh, and uh, full disclosure, my wife is also a software engineer. Uh, some of you, <laughs> those of you who read my Facebook page know that we got married because we were in a class together and she got an A on a homework assignment that everybody else in the class failed. And I'm like, I got to get to know her. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, one of the things that she really likes about it is that, uh, you know, it's, it's a field where there's no bullshit. Her code mm -hmm. shows up for itself. Right. And uh, I can say bullshit on this line, right? It's our own yeah. line. Um, right. It shows up for itself. And so she doesn't have to, uh, I mean, you know, as happens in almost every field, there, of course, are going to be some men who are like, are you sure that's right? Did you <laughs> check your work? Stuff like that. that's, that's the thing. But the nice thing about it is you can say, try it. It works. Yeah. It's mathematical. This is a proof. Uh, Code, computer code is actually advanced mathematics. Um, so I would recommend uh, if, it, but only if it's right for you, right? I mean, I know a lot of people who in 2000 went into software because there weren't a lot of jobs for uh, English lit majors and they were miserable because those two things are nothing like each other. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so the top companies have been inspiring. Google's been indicted for uh, for anti-competitive practice. The United States charged six Russian military intelligence officers in major cyber attacks, which of the following was not a target of the suspects. A, the French presidential election. B, the electricity grid in Ukraine. C, the opening ceremony of the 2018 Winter Olympics. D, the Twitter accounts of several high-profile Americans. Just to be clear, we want to clarify Borat, 
Borat is not one of the Russian intelligence attacks on the United States. <laughs> so I actually read this article. Well, and because you told us you have a military intelligence background. I know. So this is what actually astounds me by it. Uh, the answer happens to be uh, the Twitter accounts of, uh, of six high-profile Americans. So the United States is draw drawing forward these charges because of the French Olympics or the, the French uh, presidential election, French presidential election, um, the 2018 Olympics, which did not happen in the United States. Right. And uh, uh, industry of uh, uh, the power industries of the Ukraine. Right. So uh, the United States is bringing forward these charges and none of the charges actually occurred inside the United States. So one of the things that's actually being discussed is actually international jurisdiction and doesn't even the United States have the right to bring forward these charges because none of the charges that they're bringing forward actually ever even affected the United States in any way. Well, Interesting. But but you're, so we think it's the Twitter account of high profile Americans? I'm almost positive. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Good job, Eric. But, but so then <laughs> but then that would be Americans. So that's the one. Well, where, that's the one that didn't. Include. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right. So, wait, what? It didn't? Oh, my God. I misunderstood the question. That's <laughs> crazy. Yep. So we're going after them for all the other ones. We're going after them for everything that uh, the United States is going after these uh, individuals for are international issues that never even took place in the United States. And the United States is bringing forward charges on them. Wow. That's pretty crazy. So... Accusing them of uh, attacking the elections in France, yep. uh, which is interesting. So you know we should talk. I uh, do talk a little bit, right? The French presidential election is, in many ways, for the Libertarian Party, uh, something that we say, "Oh, we like that that could happen." That a person could go from not having a political party to starting up a new political party, and in the next election cycle, being elected president. <laughs> That's a pretty astonishing thing. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that the Russians meddled in it. Interesting. <laughs> um, the Winter Olympics, right? That's the boring. Oli I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I love hockey. Uh, You're attacking my Scandinavian roots. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then obviously Ukraine. We know that Russia hates the Ukraine. Um it's surprising, though, that, uh, you know, they're interested in all of these foreign things. I mean, do they have standing? What What's the point of it? Is it a boogeyman thing? Yeah. Do we know why, Eric, have they talked about why they're going after them for those things? No, actually, uh, the article, while it listed out what was being charged, uh, the, the reasons and the rationales behind a lot of them are still being played close to the vest at this point. Interesting. I mean, obviously, a lot of internet traffic travels through the United States, so I wonder if there's something to do with that. So, question number three. Trump cut off an interview with which program and later taunted its star on Twitter? 60 Minutes, Frontline, Good Morning America, or the Ingram Angle? I'm assuming that's pronounced Ingram. Yeah. Okay. Is it, is it 60 Minutes? He was, like, yelling at Leslie Stahl about something. Yeah, we talked so about that a little bit yesterday, um, or last week. Yeah, that, the big uh, book you gave her. <laughs> exactly, they gave her this giant book. Leslie, did you know that we've done more for healthcare? I can't do it, Trump. I, it's, just, it's so terrible because, like, it would be the best impression to have. Um, we've done more for healthcare than any other administration. Here's this book, and she opened it up and blank pages. Wait. 3,000 blank pages. Yeah, but I mean, who's printing these books? You should have just given her like the, one of those fake, you remember um, like Time Life uh, magazines used to sell these books and one of the books was like fake so you could hide your jewelry in it. He could have just uh, given her one of those and, like that lift would, it up in a box. Right, that, that would have been awesome. At least it would be useful. <laughs> exactly. If like, you know, she opens up the book and like, Oh my God, the Watergate tapes. They were here all the time. <laughs> Something like that. All right, so that's Jimmy good. Uh, body. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, it was Leslie Stahl who, uh, you know, as 
she's a reporter who's been around for a long time, still an uh, old school journalist, old school enough that you show her a book, she's actually going to open it. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, Trump goes after her, which is just you know, classic. Um, hey, guys, we need, to, we need to give a little shout out to Tim Metzger. You see that? He's a registered Republican and he's voting Libertarian. Oh, that's awesome, Tim. Thank you, Thank you very much. Tim. I appreciate it. Hey, Tim, tell us where you're voting from. I'll put that up in a second. Um, and Welcome thanks for watching party, Libertarians Tim. at Large. Um, that's a good thing to know. And yes, please, we are watching your comments as they come in. I'm going back and forth, but eagle eyes on the rest of the, the people are watching and they see everything that's going I on. I just realized you could see the comments because I always <laughs> have a <laughs> private chat. <laughs> no, private chat is also good. Uh, that's where, you know, I tell Eric that he has spinach in his teeth or something like that. <laughs> but uh, other than that... Uh, I do love my spinach. What can I say? Yeah, <laughs> I am what I am. Um, so, uh, which company has agreed to plead guilty to criminal charges and face penalties of roughly $8.3 billion for its role in the op opioid epidemic. Purdue remember. Pharma, Johnson & Johnson, McKesson, or Teva? It's either Purdue or Johnson. Um, I think it's Purdue. Seeing, uh, I know Purdue produces... Chickens. Uh, well, so I'm assuming those are not, different not, not, not Purdue. Um, <laughs> I know that Purdue, Purdue Pharma does produce uh, some uh, really powerful uh, knockout drugs. Um, I'm forgetting the term right now. Yeah. Um, Narcotics or sedatives or, yeah. Yeah, they're Oxycontin. There you go. Uh, yeah, so that's it. it. It is indeed Purdue Pharma. Ooh, Good yeah. job. You know, <clears throat> it's an interesting thing because... Uh, you know, one of the things libertarians talk about a lot is that uh, the justice system and seeking civil relief actually is a better way to address a lot of problems like this. Um, now, uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot is that 80% of the people who uh, become addicted to opiates start on somebody else's prescription pain medicine. Mm -hmm. like this stuff. Uh, I confess that I've never taken Oxycontin, but I did get Vicodin once mm -hmm. for having some teeth out, uh, and I didn't take them uh, because it just didn't hurt that much. And I don't know when things change. You have to have all your wisdom teeth out at once too, but they took all my wisdom teeth out, but really by the end of the day, I didn't care. Two years later, I have to stack some firewood, and I tweak my back right beforehand. And I'm like, ah, I've got five hours of hard labor in front of me. Uh, and my back is killing me. I'm gonna go take two Vicodin. And fall asleep. <laughs> no, 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 just the opposite. Uh, it, and that's the thing about it that's so seductive. You are not impaired at all. You don't feel high. Uh, you don't have any, you can do everything that you wanna do. You could drive, everything like that, but you have no pain. And you can work. And so I worked five hours hard labor uh, with a tweaked back. And one of the really interesting things that's happening is that I think we might have had this conversation. So you guys tell me when I start to repeat myself. It's the early Alzheimer's. Um, <laughs> in Massachusetts, and I'm assuming it's the same in everybody else's neck of the woods, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's in the morning, there's going to be a group of men out front who are looking for day labor. Uh, and in Massachusetts, the, the going rate is $100 a day. Uh, some of you will come by with a pickup truck. I need four guys. You hop in. You can make $100 every single day if you want to go out and work hard. Mm -hmm. And, right, you don't have to be, uh, don't have to have a driver's license, don't have to be a citizen. No questions asked. You just come mm -hmm. out and work. If that's your job, you're making, you know, $500, $600 a week, you can support a family. You can support people working, and these are hardworking people. On the other hand, <coughs> excuse me, if you tweak your ankle, right, there's no health insurance. Mm -hmm. You can't work that day. There's no vacation time. And somebody says to you, hey, I can sell you a couple of Vicodin for 25 bucks. And then you can work the whole day, even with your ankle hurting. And you don't realize that it's actually worse than that. The next day, your ankle still hurts. And so you take $25 more of Vicodin. And that's where, I mean, 
Brett Favre is probably the most famous Vicodin addict on the planet. And if Brett Favre, under doctor supervision, can become addicted to Vicodin, then Joe Schmo, who's doing day labor, can be addicted. And that's where most people are becoming addicted to opiates. And then the thing about it is that $25 for Vicodin, but it's $5 for a bump of heroin. Right. The heroin will kill you. Yeah. And so it's an interesting thing to talk about, you know, these guys. Uh, let's, let's give a quick shout out to John Stewart, who's independent, voting for Joe Jorgensen. John, I miss you on The Daily Show. Come back. <laughs> um, but I, I'm you, glad John. to see you jumping aboard. Thanks, John. Yep. I'm glad to see you becoming aboard uh, and joining the Libertarians. Um, so the, the, a lot of new great people coming into the party here. This is great. Well, and what was interesting, too, was, you know, we had uh, our chairman, Joe Bishop Henchman, published a list of uh, all the libertarians running across the country. Although, interestingly enough, when we published that list, we found out that uh, we probably knew only about 80 percent of the people actually running across the country. So we're going to be sending out a new list tonight with even more people. Oh, wow. uh, and well, right. what I liked is that uh, Valerie had a fantastic comment on it. How can there be 600 people on this list when libertarians don't run anybody at the local level? <laughs> so we hear every every two years, even every four years, especially. What do you just expect to come in and you know, come out of nowhere, just run for president? OK, well, you know, a thousand people every year run for local office and some of them are unopposed. They're not even. They're going to win no matter what. So, yeah, we're here. We're here. We're in, in yeah, shout, shout out <laughs> to uh, my friend Jim Turney, uh, who actually was reelected earlier this year in uh, city council, city commissioner, city plan, city. He's in charge of the city of Altamonte, Florida. And he was unopposed. Mm -hmm. Libertarian, in charge, unopposed. And why? Because every person there realized he saved them an enormous amount of money since he came into power. That's what happens when you get a libertarian elected. I love talk about, hearing the fact that libertarians get elected. I still don't want libertarians unopposed, though. Well, <laughs> I I agree with that. I mean, I, I I think other libertarians should oppose them. I mean, that's what we do best. That's that's what we do best. We should create our own opposition now. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is, a, but you know, in that thing, there's actually a very important libertarian. Uh, mayor in the news. You guys know what Cassandra Fryman did this week? Yeah. Dallas Val. She uh, is the mayor of Plymouth, Ohio. Yep. And she uh, waived the fines and points for three traffic violations uh, for her city uh, because it was a hardship, a undue hardship to those three people. Um, and processing and prosecuting the three people for the charges would have cost the city more than collecting the money. And, and made the determinant they actually, they weren't causing anybody any harm. Yeah. There were no victims to their crime. So a libertarian, elected libertarian mayor looked at it and said, no victim, Yeah. no, no crime. crime. No crime. She How's also decriminalized marijuana in her, uh, in her city too. She did. She was the deciding vote to decriminalize marijuana as well in Plymouth, Ohio. Which, you know, maybe that's where the next free state project is going. I'm going to go to Plymouth, Ohio. Plymouth, Ohio. <laughs> I actually have no idea where Plymouth is in Ohio, but it's a really good idea. And I am very excited to see libertarians in the elected libertarians in the news doing libertarian things. Yeah. Purdue Pharma. Yeah. It, you know, it's a tough thing. Opioids we are turned terrible. you off from that one, didn't we? <laughs> well, yeah, but that, that's what we want to do. I want to have kind of a free <laughs> flowing conversation. There you go. Circle back. <laughs> one of the interesting things, though, is that, uh, you know, there is, there, opioids really are a scourge. I mean, they are killing people in unbelievable numbers. Libertarians are the only ones who really are talking about legitimate solutions because mm -hmm. prohibition just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so let's go to the next one. Uh, documentary Francesco debuted at the Rome Film Festival on Wednesday. In the film, Pope Francis votes support for which issue? A, abortion rights. B, the death penalty. C, female, pris, female priests. D, same-sex civil unions. I feel like this question we had last week. Actually, I've picked up on a trend okay. on the New York Times. Yes. Uh, we've been doing them from week to week now. 
And there's always a gay question. There is always a gay question. Well, but uh, do, do you feel cheated because this question was last week we talked about it? Or did we? It wasn't a question. We, we didn't talked talk about, about the it. documentary. We talked, yeah. Right. We talked about it because it was Thursday and they didn't get a chance to get into their quiz yeah. until the next day, which is all right. So that's what it is. So we know. We know this one's same sex union, yeah. civil unions. Uh, it's not as, it's not the perfect libertarian solution. Uh, it's not the uh, the French solution, which the more I've been thinking about, it, I thought about it a week since we talked about it. You know, France has five year civil right. unions that you have to go back to court and renew, otherwise it's over. <laughs> That's not a bad plan. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't feel lazy. That's exactly our problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we can't stay married. <laughs> um, all right. Number six, a court ruling in which country has effectively banned legal abortions? A, Brazil. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't hear nothing about this. A, Brazil. B, Italy. C, Mexico. D, Poland. Now, we have some people watching from Poland. Yeah, where's our Polish friends? Yep. Does anybody know this? Yes. I mean, because it, it has to do with Eastern Europe. I mean, there, there you yeah. go. Yeah. If, yeah. if it's Eastern Europe, then it's going to be Brazil, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it is Poland. Fun. All right, Polish libertarians, shout out uh, those of you who were watching earlier. I, I confess that the name scrolled past, but tell us what you think about this. Um, and congratulations to Tom for getting it uh, before we even said it. Yeah, well, you, you did see Tom's earlier comment right about me. <laughs> I did a post it, Dan. <laughs> no, I missed that one. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a classic. Um, <laughs> so. Constitutional Tribunal ruled Thursday that abortions for fetal abnormalities violate the country's constitution. Oh. A decision which cannot be appealed effectively imposes a near total ban in a nation that already has some of the strictest abortion laws in Europe. Now, obviously, uh, all right, I'm going to throw this out to the body. What's the name of the thing that allows Europeans to travel between all countries essentially freely? Skengen? Is that it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Okay. <laughs> Everybody in the EU can, without a passport, travel back and forth between all the mm -hmm. uh, other EU nations. It's one of the big things that people were concerned about for Brexit. So, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so it's interesting because in Poland, obviously, you can just hop on a train, and you're in Germany like that, and. I believe the EU also has reciprocal health insurance. In fact, I know that's true for a fact because one of the things that the British were very concerned about is that there's a lot of expats, uh, British uh, citizens who have retired to Spain where, mm -hmm. you know, your retirement is enough to allow you to live like a king. Yeah. And they get, uh, you know, the best of Spanish health care uh, with their British mm -hmm. retirement. And then when England leaves Brexit, then that won't be a, uh, that won't exist anymore. But for right now, e citizens in Poland, which is a part of the EU, can go anywhere else and, uh, and get an abortion if they want to. But seeing as in the United States, abortion is an issue that is only met to divine voters and really not talk about the issues at all, I think we roll on. To somebody who's not controversial at all, <laughs> Alexandra or Ke uh, Ortiz Cortez? A I just know it's AOC. What's the middle? Ortiz? Ocasio. Thank you. Um, Ocasio Cortez. Uh, which novel approach did Representative? Oh, it's written right there. Me read good. <laughs> <laughs> which novel approach did Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez take to help spur voters to the polls? A. She created a viral TikTok dance. B, she dressed up as a ballot box. C, she invited her followers to watch her play a video game. Or D, she ran a marathon around her congressional district. The uh, video game thing, because um, Justin Amash was also talking about the same video game thing. I don't play video games, which is why I'm using such wonderful words. This is, right, this is the game uh, Among Us, right? Now, I don't know a lot about it, but my understanding is that, uh, all right, we're going to say the first super controversial thing uh, <laughs> of, of this half hour. Um, 
It is essentially an iteration of a board game that probably most of us have played called Secret Hitler. It's uh, There are people among you in the group game among us who are bad guys, but you don't know who they are. Only the bad guys know who they are. Mm -hmm. And then you're on the spaceship and the bad guys go around and sabotage the spaceship and the good guys go around and try to fix, fix the spaceship. And uh, anybody who's online, like, like Michael Brick knew was a video game, if you wanted to give us a better description of Among Us than that, uh, we'll definitely pop it up there. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, it's a wide open game. It doesn't require a complicated computer. And there's a bunch of people there, new people each time. So you go. That being said, have you, any of you guys played Secret Hitler? Uh -uh. Oh. I've played games like it, but I've never played a game called Secret <laughs> Hitler. Uh so, <laughs> It's it's it actually used to be called something else. They changed the name so you could play it, but the essence of it is is that uh, if that well, was they, improving the name, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it used to be called Who's the Asshole? <laughs> right, exactly. So the, the 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 way the game works, and I definitely recommend to look for your game store is that everybody gets an envelope. You like to play with like eight people, and uh, so not right now. Not right now, <laughs> although it would be a fun game to do. You get a card, and it tells you what team you're on. Four of you are liberals, three of you are fascists, and one of you is Hitler. So then you open your uh, – everybody closes their eyes. All the fascists put their hands into the room in the middle of the table and put their thumb up, and then they open their eyes. And so the fascists can see who the other fascists are in the room, but they don't know – who's Hitler and the liberals don't know who anybody is. Then proposals start coming up and they don't actually go into the specifics. This is a fascist proposal. This is a liberal proposal and you vote on them. There's a lot of manipulation in terms of how the game happens. If you can get X number of fascist things passed, you win. You also elect a chancellor. If Hitler gets elected chancellor, the fascists win. Uh, it's this really complicated game, but you don't know who anybody is. And so, there's all sorts of like really sophisticated deception where people pretend to be stupid and uh, it's just, it's awesome. I like can't recommend the game enough. <laughs> if, you, if you can get together eight people for a board game night, that should be on your list of things to do. Hmm. The shortest and strangest season in Major League Baseball is coming to a close. <laughs> Sorry, what did... What did I miss? Oh, oh, Tom had a great comment there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I cannot deny that. Yeah. Anybody uh, knows LNC elections. Hitting the nail on the head right there. <laughs> <laughs> the shortest and strangest major league season of Major League Baseball in history is actually done. Uh, I'm not going to go with these answers. Tell me who won the World Series. L.A.? Valerie wins. <laughs> right. <laughs> I thought I heard something. I mean, my team won last year, so. Who won last year? Right? Wasn't it last year or the year before? The Astros? I'm... No, the Nats. No, Nats the Nats won last year. Yeah. yeah, I've lost track of like how long things have taken recently. We live in this <laughs> weird time void right now that, uh, you know, you, the, the whole last year is, it's yeah. at least the last six months, right? Yeah. It, it seems to me at times that I'm like, this is the same week as last week, mm -hmm. except for, I mean, I, in many ways, I'm happy that there's an election going on because yeah. I know yeah. that things have been progressing, like right? Grandpa's I know that. Day. Exactly. Like the movie. It's like everything is just the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With minor, you know, changes. Now Tom's just picking fights. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we get to talk about the fact, I mean, if, you, if you're from Long Island, Long Island, <laughs> and you're an Islanders fan, um, you know, actually I wanted to go back. Joanna posted a question earlier on. And before we go on to the next one, let me go back and find it. And then I don't know if we have comments about this, but if we do, we can talk about it. Where is it? She talked about the fact that Walmart is, uh, changing their gun sales for this week. Has anybody heard anything about that? Mm -hmm. I hadn't. No, no, I haven't heard anything about that. I hadn't heard anything about that either. Here, here's the comment. Walmart is pulling firearms off the sale floors because of civil unrest. I haven't heard anything about that. Somebody mm -hmm. else. Uh, oh, Eric's on it. 
Oh, I'm looking this up. <laughs> All right, that's good. So let's do it. Oh, they have their guns. It's an interesting thing to talk about. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if Walmart in Maryland sells guns. There's a, there's a nice shop near me uh, that I go to, and it, it feels like it's overpriced. Uh, Joanna says it was in the New York Times. So, yeah. and CNBC only announced this three hours ago. So it's this news cycle. So this is fresh. So oh, wow. we'll be on the quiz next week. Breaking. Yep. Breaking right. news. Well, Let's have a breaking conversation. <laughs> Let's get the easy stuff out of the way. A business can do whatever the heck they want. They don't want to sell guns this week. They, they don't have to sell guns this week. We agree on all of that. And I'm sure all the other gun shops are like, yay. No right? competition like, at Walmart. Are people who are involved in civil unrest needing guns? I'm sorry. They already have guns. You know, I'm, I'm just saying like... You should be able to buy a gun whenever. So let me set that aside. But right. due to civil unrest seems a little strange because I would say people who are actively trying to shoot people because of civil unrest would already have like a shit ton of guns, like a, right. their own army. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, my favorite quote is is the Mark Feldman one. I think I played it on the air here um, where uh, at the presidential debate in 2016, Larry Elder said, so Dr. Feldman, you know, what do you do? You support gun control? He said, I do support gun control. I want people to control their guns. <laughs> yeah. Do I want criminals Water to have gun. guns? I don't. I don't know how to stop them from getting them because they don't obey the law. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's where we are. You know, Walmart so in not June, Walmart pulled ammo uh, mm -hmm. because of uh, the George Floyd uh, incident in Minneapolis. <laughs> um now they're pulling firearm and ammo sales in selected stores, not a free store. So, so probably in I mean, Democrat stores. You said there was some um, Philly stores getting looted, so that makes sense. If you're if you're going in there to steal them, and so it's not because they're trying not to sell them, it's that they're trying not to get them stolen. Okay, right. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, mean, I and actually, sense. you know, it's interesting because that ties back into uh, the Purdue Farmer. Thing. There's a lot of uh, pharmacies that stopped carrying OxyContin mm -hmm. entirely because people were breaking in to get it. Yeah. And I feel like saying George Floyd incident is a horrible way of putting it, but that's how this news site listed it. So fair enough. Yeah. Right. We, we, we think it's more than an incident, and that's yeah. really fair. All right. Let's pop up the next news story. Which college fraternity already, I'm not going to do well on this question. <laughs> Uh, is facing a revolt over racism and its embrace of Robert E. Lee as a spiritual founder. Is it Kappa Alpha? <laughs> Sorry. Kappa Sigma, Phi Gamma Delta, Sigma Alpha Epsilon, or I'm throwing in a fourth, fifth choice, Lambda, Lambda, Lambda. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. If you'd asked me, I would have bet money that Kappa's, if it starts with Kappa, it's a sorority. No. But I don't know. Um, did no, your colleges have big Greek systems? Mine did. Yeah, where did you, where did you go to school, Eric? Uh, I went to George Washington University. Uh, Here in D.C. I actually, uh, I actually pledged Sigma Nu. All right. No. They don't claim Robert E. Lee as a I probably was at a party you. in your backyard. Um, <laughs> There you go. Uh, no, actually, uh, we were started at um, Virginia Military Institute, but uh, no uh, direct ties to uh, uh, to Robert E. Lee. So, uh, yeah. Well, but it's interesting because VMI is in the news today as well. Yep. Since you brought that up, do you want to mention them? Actually, I ha I've seen the headline, but I have not read the article yet. So, well, I so you're an American newsreader. Go on. <laughs> uh, it, VMI is essentially uh, they are pulling down a statue of Stonewall Jackson. Yeah, which is uh, no, I, I I commend them for that. I mean, I mean Stonewall Jackson was well, an amazing cavalry officer. We'll all amazing agree with that. Cavalry officer. He was their dean uh, yep. for mm -hmm. a long time. Uh, so yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> Tom Mann has drank a funny juice tonight. 
<laughs> alcohol. He mentioned that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, uh, I guess he's freely traveling around Europe because that was the requirement. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. that is, uh, so yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I, I have no idea which fraternity has Robert E. Lee. I but you know it's interesting. I I grew up in uh, Texas, and, and with Val, you grew up in Virginia. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I assume that you know in your childhood, Robert E. Lee was mentioned in school as a you know revered figure. Yes. Um, my house, my the house I grew up in, lived you know however many years, a hundred years, um, was right around the corner from the uh, Robert E. Lee plantation. Interesting. Yeah. I can recall, you know, I mean, the stuff they taught us in school, how Robert E. Lee was uh, Ulysses S. Grant commander uh, during the Mexican War and uh, that Lincoln actually asked him to be the Union general. But because he loved Virginia so much, which I mean, that's not a sentiment that you hear a lot anymore, that, that he ended up going to the South. It's it's a fascinating thing. So do we have any guess? As to the fraternity? Just, just the first one, because it's in like alphabetical order. All I don't right. know. I, I don't think it's S A. What it is? Let's go for it. whatever it is. But right. I'm going to look through. Uh, yeah, I see. lived with a fraternity in college, and um, that's not on that list. So that's the only one All right. that I know. Right. I, I knew an S A E. I think they, they're Sammies. Maybe not. Um, so I'm going to say it's not them. I agree. Kappa Alpha. Yo, nice job, Val. Oh, yeah, good. Members of Southwestern <laughs> University, which is uh, in Georgetown, just north of where I did my first undergrad, uh, demanded the fraternity drop its association with the league and investigate the racial harms they say Kappa Alphas have inflicted. A few hours later, suspension notice arrived from the fraternity's national organization. Nineteen chapter presidents have since signed an internal petitioning echoing their demands. Uh, you know, it's interesting, right? Look at this. We got a book right here. The Last True Gentleman, The Last Gentle Knight. It's, uh, there's a, uh, a great story about, uh, you know, the best place, I think, to get most of your moral education is Batman. Um, <laughs> and in, uh, in Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, uh, they have a conversation about, did Roosevelt know that the Japanese were coming to Pearl Harbor. You guys know there's a conspiracy, not just conspiracy theorists, there's, there's some evidence that they had a better mm -hmm. idea, et cetera, stuff like that. And uh, Commissioner Gordon at the time sort of concludes, he's like, you can't judge it. The issue is so big that you just have to acknowledge it without judgment and say, this is what it could have been and accept the fact that there's something there. And I think when we confront, you know, the roots of our slavery, mm -hmm we just have to acknowledge the fact that that's what happened. There's this terrible point, you know, in many ways, the original sin of the United States. Uh, and it is inexplicably tied to our history. And there's no way to, you know, go anywhere beyond that, except that there was a long time when we supported slavery. And, and you know, it's not like we got amazingly better right away. And, you know, you can't deny the fact everybody knows Abraham Lincoln said, if I could preserve the union, uh, but I had to keep slavery, I would do it. Mm -hmm. So we have this thing in our back. So I think it's appropriate that we're still talking about these things and talking about ways that we can get better around this stuff. I think we should note that Patricia thinks that Star Trek is a better moral guide than- uh, Star Trek might be a better moral guy than uh, Batman. I agree. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, in many ways, you know, but, you know, it's one of the great lessons of Batman, <laughs> which is where I thought we were going to go tonight. But, you know, Batman refuses to kill. And he in The Dark Knight Return, he talks about the fact that he hasn't killed the Joker, even though he knows that not killing the Joker means the Joker is going to kill a lot more people at some point in time because he always escapes from jail. I don't even know why they, why they put him in jail. And he goes out and commits terrible things. It's... Very informative reading for me for <laughs> and my sevens and eights. Um, what did Disney add to some older films on its streaming service? A, blooper reels. B, sensor bars. C, CGI animation. D, warning for racist stereotypes. Yes, I feel D. like 
Yeah, I feel like yeah. we got there already. Yeah. <coughs> Critical. Um, oh, and they even mentioned Dumbo. I think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. Dumbo was the first film I saw in the theater. Um, actually, that's not true. Song of the South was the first film I saw in the theater. Also racist depictions. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, Dumbo has the, uh, the prelude to Heckle and Jekyll, the, uh, mm -hmm. the crows, the magpies who, you know, are obviously stereotypical African-Americans of the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Not to mention, uh, you know, yeah, well, th here they have the pictures, right? Indians in Peter Pan, uh, stuff like that. I, one of the things that kills me, one of my, uh, aside from Batman, did any of you guys ever read the Tintin books? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Tintin's awesome. But, you know, it's written by a Belgian guy in the 30s. Incredibly racist. Okay. <laughs> Depiction of African-Americans, Asians, everybody. It's just unbelievable. And I'd kind of forgotten about them. And I bought them for my nephews. I bought the entire set. I'm like, this is awesome. Because when I was a kid, we had to buy them like one at a time, save up money. Uh, you know, my, my mother was, uh, I'm going to tell a quick story about my mother who was uh, a children's librarian and had been waiting all her uh, adult life waiting for the first child who would read. And that was me. Uh, and I was reading pretty young. Uh, and she had all these books, Caldecott award winners, the amazing illustrations she'd saved up for me. And about two and a half, I was starting to really read independently and she would give me the books. And of course I can ask, uh, Valerie, who's raising a child right now, if you ask a two and a half year old to do something, the answer is no, 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 no. So I would always tell my mother, no, I wouldn't read any of the books that she gave me. So what she did is she would send me out into the backyard to play. And then she would scatter the books around on the floor in my room and say, Daniel, go clean up your room. <laughs> Knowing that my ADHD, I would be in there. And then I'd be like, oh, what's this? <laughs> and that's how she would get me to read these books. Um, <laughs> Tom, so thought, Mann, Tom Mann wants to know if we've ever watched Fantasia on a um, hallucinogenic. I have. I, 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 I can't stand to watch that show, yeah. that movie anyhow. I've watched it a few times with kids, and it's like, yee. The, the thing with the Sorcerer's Apprentice and Mickey Mouse and the, you know, that I like that part a lot. Uh, and when I went to high school, I went to high school in Colorado, and uh, my high school also had a ranching component in it. And so you would go out and pick magic mushrooms, shake them over the cow patties and come out a month later and magically, right? There's 20 of them. So, uh, yeah, that was another important part of my childhood. <laughs> um, question number 11, we're getting to the end of the news quiz. And it's a good thing because we're almost at the end of our hour. A 2000 year old etching of which animal was discovered by archeologists on a hillside in Peru? Was it an alpaca, a cat, an eagle or a penguin? I saw this too. Did any, does anybody know? I saw this. I thought I it was. Don't, but I can't imagine why it would be, why it would be newsworthy that they had an alpaca or a cat. It's a cat. Is it a cat? Uh -huh, I thought it was fake. I thought it was fake news. No, <laughs> a geoglyph, which I'm going to guess means painting on the earth, uh, <laughs> of what appears to be a cat lounging. It says dates to 200 to 100 BC is the latest discovery. Whoa. Now, that is interesting. Can you guys see the picture? No, because no. I'm not showing it. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, it's it giant. Looks like, right? I thought it was fake because it looks like a kid. It looks like one of my kids drew like it. That. <laughs> I, I wonder if it's going to turn out to be fake, like crop circles or something. Um, but that's pretty interesting. Hmm. I had a, uh, a an art history professor uh, my freshman year in college, and... Uh, he said, all right, we're going to start off with uh, some basic education. And he pulls up a picture of the Grand Pyramid at Cheops, uh, which is, let me just add, so incredibly old we don't understand. Cleopatra's birthday is closer to our time than it is to the building of the Grand Pyramid. Um, so he pulls a picture of the Grand Pyramid and he says, okay, who built the pyramids? And somebody says, the Egyptians. It's like, no, no. Somebody else says, slave, slave built pyramids. He's like, no. Do people know anything? UFOs built the pyramids. <laughs> Come on, people. So, Ancient aliens. It, exactly. 
And there was a, I mean, there was a big thing in the, uh, in the seventies, Laura, I, I don't know if you remember this as well as I do, but there was a, uh, alien, there, this belief that aliens had come and made these giant landing strips all over the world of guides of where they're supposed to be and stuff like that. And it, Jared, thank you so much. I'm glad hey, we were in the same class. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put the kids to sleep and I'll see you guys next week at a later time. And next time at a later time, we'll be doing a greater job. Thank you, Val, so much Thank for you. tuning in. Thank you. guys. All Bye. right. Bye. Let's talk in our time left about the week, final week in the election because there's still a lot that people could do. Oh, absolutely. Like, what are you thinking about, Eric? What, what's something that you, would, you can do right now? Well, I mean, there are so many call banks, text banks, door knocking, uh, poll uh, watching or, or, or uh, meeting and greeting people at the polls, yep. uh, obviously being socially distanced about it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, there's so many uh, things that you could be doing. Like you had said earlier in this, in this show, there is nothing that beats just, you know, pounding the pavement and getting out there because postcards are, and signs don't vote. So, uh, no, it, it's, uh, it's awesome. You know, yep. I, and so well, I mean, Jared, I, I see that you're a supporter of Rainwater, and I'm very excited about his race. So uh, there's a lot of races out there. Um, Joe uh, Joe Bishop Henchman put out a list of uh, must watch races uh, for uh, for Libertarian candidates, and uh, Rainwater is at the top. And uh, there's a lot of other great lists, uh, a lot of other great names yep. uh, on there. So yeah, yeah. How about you, Dr. Epke? Any one you were thinking about that, like you're saying, I really want to see how that one turns out. I'm I'm really interested in in the rainwater race, obviously, and in large part because there's this thing going on on Jared's Facebook page um, about tattoos, and I've suggested that you know we should all get tattoos, rainwater tattoos, if he wins um, at the next LNC meeting. We're just going to have a mobile tattoo shop pull up. Um, so, so, so I'm interested in that one. Um, the other ones, I mean, you know, obviously the Wyoming legislative races are exciting. I, I'm still interested to see how many votes, um, is it Ricky Harrington? Is that it? Yeah, Ricky Dale right? Harrington. And Arkansas, um, how many votes he gets. Um, but then I mean, there's a lot of local races. I'm just excited. Um, I think that we're going to see, um, we're going to see some wins and we're going to see some strong showings. And um, you know, set us up really well for two years from now, and 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 that's what we you know we net we need to keep thinking you know every election we need to keep thinking to the next election and 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 trying to set ourselves up for more and more success. So I am going to put a race on your radar that you guys probably aren't aware of right now. Liz De Signore is running in Nevada in Las Vegas for city council, and the incumbent or her her. The lead in the race, the dominant lead in the race, was just found to not live in their dist in the district and is ineligible to sit, to be seated. Oh. It's unclear whether or not they will remove him from the ballot, hmm. but right now it's out there that he cannot serve. So why would you vote for him? And in addition to that, he was also found to have spent his campaign funds, allegedly to have spent campaign funds on things not campaign related. So I think that Liz De Signore, uh, who lives, you know, Nevada, Nevada, has got a strong party, and they are getting out a lot of action behind her right now. And it's one of those great things that shows you that you, everybody who's thinking about running, who's going to run, you always have to be ready to gear up your campaign, to have some way to say, if something came up and somebody suddenly gave me $5,000, how would I spend it? Because right now, Liz is in this situation where her campaign is getting ready to spin, spin up. And fortunately, she's a tech person, super smart. Um, she assisted a lot in the uh, second convention. And, uh, you know, she's going to be able to take advantage of that. And so, knock on wood, we're going to see a surprising result in Nevada as well. Let me make one more. What, what, one sure, more. go ahead. Okay, so um, big weekend ahead for um, for the for the Jorgensen Cohen campaign. Um, Joe is going to be in Council Bluffs, Iowa this weekend on Saturday, I think at 1.30. There is no Nebraska football game, so Nebraskans should show up. Um, Iowans should show up. South Dakotans should show up. 
if you if you're looking for something to do this weekend that's you know that'll be fun and is um, less um, you know less stressful, come to the come to that event because um, you know the more people we've got there the pictures that get taken um, that will that will stir some some action up in in that part of the world so um, there'll be some there'll be some press there I'm sure but you know we need to have a good turnout let me put a little go ahead Cheryl's gonna be in uh, uh, Nebraska on Saturday she's gonna be in North Carolina Iowa. on so oh Iowa sorry yeah. she's gonna be in Iowa on <laughs> Be in Iowa on Saturday, and she's going to be in North Carolina on Sunday in Winston Salem. Uh, uh, it's a uh, distillery that she's going to be touring. Another great time, and there's going to be uh, free samples, so uh, good reason to come. Free samples for booze. North Carolina is not that far from me. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about it right now. Now, uh, here's the thing: I just want to point out, Iowa on Saturday, Council Bluffs is going to have a high of 60 for this time of year. That's shorts weather. It's going to be great, and, right? and 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 yours truly will be there. I'm. I think I'm the first one speaking, actually. So that's I'm outstanding. Yeah. So I mean, you get a chance to go see Dr. Epke. Yeah. Uh, wonderful weather, and if you've never had a pork chop in Iowa, you don't know what you're missing. Those guys do that right. Not that they don't do pork right in North Carolina as well. I, I'm glad you covered yourself, Dan. Well, <laughs> I, 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 we're not going to talk about vinegar being in barbecue. Uh, all right. <laughs> we got, that's that's the second show when we add the second show it's going to be eric and dan and uh, laura debating barbecue um, <laughs> but for this time this is as always libertarians at large you guys have an incredible future in front of you right now we can go out there and make a difference by convincing people to do their civic duty and to vote uh libertarians we talked about this last week libertarians were not big fans of government but we're huge fans of America. We appreciate the fact that this is the country that is the freest. We just don't want to be freest. We want to be free. And we're doing everything that we can. And you guys can make a difference right now. Help us make the country free. Find a way to support a libertarian candidate. Find a way to get some people out to vote. Make a difference. And we will see you all next week. Good night, everybody. At 8 o'clock. Eight At 8 o'clock next week, exactly right. 8 o'clock Eastern next week. So Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Good night, Tom. Have a great night, everybody.